the Epic of Gilgamesh. Before the creation of heaven and earth, there was a void. Genesis states that the earth was unformed and void, with darkness over the surface and of the deep, and a wind from God over the water. Though not exactly the same, it implies a similar meaning to the introduction idea of the united heaven and earth. The Epic of Gilgamesh says the same thing. In Genesis, God existed before the heavens and the earth. The Epic of Gilgamesh's introduction is entirely clear about the God, is not entirely clear about the gods who existed before the separation of heaven and earth, but we know that they did exist because they talk about them all the time. So we know that the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a huge story, and out of that huge story, which predates the Bible by thousands of years, you get the story of Noah's Ark, which is a tiny fraction of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the Epic of Gilgamesh is taught in universities all over the world in ancient civilizations. It would do Genesis and the Great Flood. In the Sumerian version of the flood story, the gods decide to destroy the human civilization. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods decide to destroy humankind because they are being too noisy while the gods are trying to sleep. But in the Eridu Genesis, they lack a clear explanation as to why they're really doing this destruction. It's just saying that, look, there's a flood coming. Enki, betraying the other gods, tells the protagonist Ziazudra. Ziazudra in the ancient Sumerian tablets is actually Noah in the Bible of his plan and how to avoid dying in the flood. He instructs him to build an ark. And we found the actual ark tablet. <clears throat> this ark tablet is a real tablet. And this ark tablet is a description of how to build the ark. And the ark was not like the one described in the Bible, which it leads to more freelancing again. The ark was described to be had built as a round uh, ship or submersible. And it had corridors in there. And the instructions were not to take two insect, two ants and, and two praying mantises and two lions and two sheep and, and two elephants and all the animals from all around the planet onto this boat, onto this round submersible. The, the, the instructions were to collect samples from your local area of your plant flora, uh, seed and so forth from around the local area and some of your local livestock. That's it. Zia Zidra versus Noah. Both Zeozidra and Noah are instructed by one god to build an ark and escape the flood. <clears throat> but the decision to destroy humanity is made by one and one only god. So in Genesis, you have the Abrahamic religions who believe only one god exists. Multiple gods decide to destroy the earth in the polytheistic Eridu Genesis. Now, when you read the Sumerian tablets, you find not only in Eridu Genesis, but in other tablets as well, that these gods had collaborated together and that some of them did not want the earth to be destroyed and they were begging to the, the the leaders Enki and Enlil primarily Enlil who had full control and decision making and also Anu their father begging to them to please not let this come not let this calamity happen and they decided that you know what the the experiment here had gone wrong the people had gotten too noisy they had gotten too wild and crazy they had gotten too intelligent. <clears throat> uh, we want to just start over. And while this flood, which seems like a directed asteroid strike, while this flood through whatever method they used, swept over the land and turned all the kingdoms into mud, they actually were on this sky ship crying and weeping, then loathing that their creation had been destroyed. But Noah and his family remain human after the flood, both Ziazudra and Noah are blessed by their gods, but in different ways. Ziazudra becomes immortal. So in the Sumerian tablets, uh, the gods give, grant Ziazudra immortality by giving him some type of genetic mutation, allowing him to live an extended lifespan. Not necessarily immortal for eternity, but an extended lifespan. In other words, more than the 120 years. And when you look at it, then you see that uh, Noah and his family remain mortal in the Bible version, right? In the book of Genesis, God establishes a covenant with humankind, promising to never destroy them again. The promise that God makes to Noah sets Abrahamic religion far apart from Mesopotamian polytheism. The Mesopotamians believed that they had to constantly keep the gods happy or else they would wreak havoc upon the earth, even when all their efforts, so forth and so well, you know, were, were being met and unpredictable. The illusion in the biblical text that, you know, we, we, we saved your family and everything's gonna be all good, but if you look at the story after the family's been saved and, and, and they're starting fresh again, right? It also says in the Bible that not everybody died. 
It also says in the Sumerian text, not everybody died. So Noah and his family were not the only people left. Read it good. Read your good book good. Read, I know the book like the back of my hand. I know the book like the back of my hand. There were giants that survived. The Anunnaki, they call them the Anak. They survived the Great Flood. And there were other people that also survived the Great Flood. Two people did not create eight billion. There were people here already. Adam and Eve was just two of many that already had existed. This is basic bare bones biology, like biology 101. The thing that happened after Noah's family uh, survived, they met other people, other survivors. They built a new civilization. They, they kick-started another civilization in that region of the planet. Other people were thriving in other parts of the world. Um, but what's interesting is they go right back into the same old ritualistic things, trying to keep God happy, trying to satisfy God all the time by having sacrifices and this and that. They went back right into the same old system again. So even though the biblical text is trying to say that, hey, they just, you know, they, they were blessed and they could start fresh again, not true. It's the same as the Sumerian version where they had to keep trying to keep the gods happy through sacrifices nonstop. So the debates, the debates is a text. It's a text that tells you the Cain and Abel story before Cain and Abel even existed. It tells you the Cain and Abel story. It's right, it reads it a little slightly differently, but it's the same exact story. The debate between the sheep and grain describes a primordial hill where the gods live. An, who is also Anu, right? The sky god creates two sisters, Ashan and the goddesses of the sheep and Lahar, the goddess of grain. An creates these goddesses to clothe and feed all the gods and goddesses on the primordial hill, but they realize that they do not understand how to use their sister's gifts, so they created man to feed and clothe the gods instead. Later, Ashan, uh, Ashnan and Lahar fight over which sister has the more meaningful gift. The story ends with the gods Enki and Enlil intervening in the debate and declaring Ashnan the winner. The similar story between, uh, that you know from the biblical text is, um, the debate, debate between Sumer and Winter. The gods create Emesh, Sumer, for vegetation and the abundance of the earth. Aten, Emesh's brother, identified with Winter, was responsible for the fertility of livestock. When the brothers fight, Enlil declares an, uh, Emesh, the more important of the two, and they reconcile after Enlil's ruling. The same Cain and Abel story over and over again. The two debates discussed above bear the most striking resemblance to the Genesis story of Cain and Abel, Genesis 4.1 through 4.16, like the debates, the story of Cain and Abel involves quarreling siblings, but while the debate tablets discuss relatively insignificant events, the story of Cain and Abel is amongst the most tragic tales in the Bible. One of the very first recorded murders, right? When God appreciates Abel's offerings, but not Cain's, Cain becomes jealous and angry. God warns Cain not to give him, uh, give him to his anger, but Cain does not listen and kills his brother Abel uh, in envious rage. God punishes Cain by cursing him to wander ceaselessly. Now, what does he do? God tells Cain, you gotta get out of here. And Cain goes in the Bible, he says, but the people out there will kill me. So wait a minute. If you believe in the version that most people believe in of the Bible, you know that there's Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel <clears throat> right? Cain kills Abel, so now there's Adam, Eve and Cain. Now Cain gets kicked out of the garden, but all of a sudden he knows that there's people out there. What people? That's in the Bible. There were millions of people already here. When, it, when Adam and Eve arrived here, there were already people here. Adam and Eve were not the first people on this planet. They were the first Homo sapiens sapien version, the first genetically modified by the Anu, by the Anunnaki, to be able to reproduce in a certain type of way. The other people, a lot of them weren't able to reproduce in that way, and the ones who were were creating a lot of uh, rarities, uh, uh, giants that uh, weren't, didn't have long lifespan, all kind of crazy stuff was going on according to these texts. When you look at the, uh, the story of the Adamu, when Isis says, I'm going to take this baby to term and I'm going to bring forth the first one that works the proper way. And she takes one of the existing hominids, which was our cousins on this planet, takes the egg out of her womb and puts it into her own womb and takes it to term for 10 months and then she gives birth to the Adamu, which means first man. That was Adam. It means that he was the first perfectly created man that can actually reproduce on his own, that had enough common sense and logic and wisdom and understanding to take orders, but also to think for himself. And then 
they tried to mate him with some of the other people that were there and they, they, the mating wasn't working. So then they took some more genetic material from him and then they cloned or recreated an Eve and had them mate. When they figured out that worked and they can have a baby, then they duplicated that experiment over and over and over again. They made a lot of atoms through the same process. Not Adam having babies with Eve, but them creating new Adams and new Eves and having them live in this Eden, E-D-I-N, which was located in Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq, according to the tablets, not according to Billy Carson. And in this mating area, they were had certain specific times they could and couldn't mate. And if you violated that, <clears throat> you would be punished. So they were cattle. They were like cattle. And that's why when Enki comes and sneaks up into the garden and starts giving them knowledge, that was the snake. And Lil comes back and discovers that they had to gain some knowledge about themselves and realize that they weren't animals, that they were sentient beings. He gets pissed off and calls his brother a snake in the tablets. You see? Unlike the debate between Sumer and Winter, Cain and Abel do not reconcile. It is a story that teaches us about the consequences of our actions, human fallibility, and so forth and so on. So basically, it's a remix of ancient stories. All this is remixed. Remixed stuff, you see? The Sumerian Tablets. The oldest tablet recorded dates back to around 2300 BCE, but the story is likely much, much older. We're talking about tens of thousands of years old, because now we have found tablets that are much older than 2300 BCE. Okay, it's polytheistic, multiple gods, has many recorded creation stories that are often incomplete because of broken tablets and such. But ironically, the parts that weren't broken make it into the Bible. Interesting. Then you have the Sumerian tradition, which includes the Great Flood story, Eridu Genesis, Zeozudra is rewarded with eternal life. The Sumerians wrote many debate stories called Disputations, which mimic Cain and Abel's story. And you look at the book of Genesis there, side by side comparison. You see the comparisons there. You see the slight remixing going on. You see that the text that made it into uh, that part of Genesis was mostly just um, plagiarized text from ancient tablets, which then were slightly remixed in some cases, but uh, ultimately come from ancient text. Very important stuff. Very, very important stuff. And so why is it important to know this? because it's important to know and understand who you are and where you came from, how we got here and what happened in the ancient past. Because until we find out what really happened in the ancient past, we can't plan for a better future because the past is prologue. We're in a, we're in a loop. This stuff keeps happening over and over and over again. We keep going through this vicious cycle of rise and fall of civilizations. We keep going through this vicious cycle of, uh, uh, situations that happened in the past reappearing in, on our timeline and happening over and over again. See, if you go back in time to 23, uh, 2023 BCE, you'll find the same exact stuff we're going through now happening back then. Not necessarily with the technology level, but with the social issues, you'll find it. Every section, every era of time that you have in our current era, match and go back and study history for that previous area in BCE, you'll find the same stuff happening. It's like we're in a time loop. We keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Until we understand and know this kind of stuff, until we dig deep into the information that we've been fed and forced to analyze it, break it apart, rip it apart and, and put it back together again, until then, We'll continue to go through this vicious cycle of rise and fall of civilizations, rise and fall of awareness and knowledge and ascension and wisdom. We'll keep getting to a certain point and falling right back down again. At some point, we got to learn how to walk and then we got to learn how to run. The Anunnaki actually are not gone. They're still here. If you look at the text, you discover there was a second pyramid war which occurred between Amun-Ra and his relatives. Some fleet and some stay. They actually dropped what they called, listen to this, Weapons of Mass Destruction on this planet. WMDs. <laughs> yeah, in ancient times. You thought you thought George Bush Jr. came up with that term for the Iraq war? Where do you think he got it from? The tablets. And in this dropping of these weapons, it created something called an evil wind in the text. And then this evil wind, whoever was in it, where this evil wind was moving, we're talking about nuclear fallout of some type, radiation fallout. People's fingernails were falling off, their hair was falling out, their nose and eyes were bleeding. 
This is all symbols. Their skin was boiling. This is all signs of radiation, uh, radiation sickness. And when you look at the region that it was talked about being dropped in, you find the, the uh, Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley. You find the, the Giza Plateau and many other areas around the region where sand and buildings were vitrified and turned into glass. Now, the fact in the Indus Valley, bodies are still laying in the street. Google Indus Valley, Mohenjo-Daro. You'll see bodies laying in the street, holding hands, just the skeletons that have never, ever, ever uh, been, uh, you know, eaten by any wild animals because they're they're radiated. They're radiated. So we know that there was a, 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 a nuclear war of some type in the ancient past. In this text, some of these beings fled to safe areas, and some left. And their bloodline is walking amongst us this very day. So in some ways, genetically, they never left. And all of us, including every single human on this planet, has a little touch of that DNA in our body. Any homo sapiens sapien has a little slight touch of that DNA in our body. So in essence, we're all here. They're watching us and they're monitoring us to see how far we're going to go and if we're going to become a rival of them.